appreciate it. I very appreciate all what you are talking about it. Good day and good day to us, the viewers. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this first weekly edition of Views on the Continent in the month of December. In South Africa, Mbatu, South African president, has rejected calls to resign after being accused of misconduct. President Cyril Ramaphosa, who doubles as head of state and president of the ruling ANC party, is facing threats of impeachment after the theft from his private game ranger of an amount ranging between $500,000 and $5 million in cash almost three years ago resurfaced last Thursday. The 70-year-old former labor activist and wealthy businessman has been accused of holding undeclared foreign currency tax evasion, failing to inform police about the robbery and misusing state resources by ordering an a senior presidential bodyguard to track down the thieves who then appear to have been paid off. The president Ramaphosa, however, denies all allegations. The Farmgate scandal has reopened deep divisions between factions within the ruling African National Congress ANC party. Most of the vocal ANC politicians and supporters of former head of state Jacob Zuma say Ramaphosa can't be re-elected as ANC president. These dogs risking his chances of running for a second term come the 2024 general elections. As of now, the president's insistence that any party official facing criminal charges of corruption should leave office pending investigation leaves him vulnerable to those who say he should do same by resigning. So the fate of President Ramaphosa ahead of this Farmgate scandal and the state of the nation with many calling for his resignation is what we shall be discussing in today's edition of Views on the Continent. Stay with us. It's always a pleasure to know you're trusting your Pan-African television since December 2022. And we are here to talk of what's making headline news in South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa is, uh, is faced with threats of impeachment following uh, a farm gate scandal. And this, uh, uh, the, this scandal is uh, ahead of uh, the 2024 presidential election as the ruling party was preparing to have re-elections for its new New president many are calling on president ramaphosa to resign the civilians or citizens are terming him to be a bad example and most of the activists and the uh, political uh, uh, officials in the ruling anc party are also condemning this act by president cyril ramaphosa but these are all allegations because uh, the incumbent still denies all accusations and says not guilty of uh, all of this so what's going to be the fate of president Cyril Ramaphosa in the days ahead as the the, the African National Congress looks at uh, the, uh, the deciding on his fate as president of the ruling party and equally uh, there is a, a, a due process that is to take place and uh, ahead of uh, in the days ahead we are going to know the results of this decision however there are a lot of accusations and allegations which are causing uh, many analysts to to group it up and to say these are all uh, uh, political political beefings between uh, the incumbent and his former press uh, former or his predecessor we should say uh, jacob zuma who equally uh, left power or was removed from power in 2018 following corruption uh, accusations so we're staying on uh, to this edition of views on the continent in the company of a couple of guests joining us from south africa is uh, mr good news Kadogan, you are a Pan-African leadership coach. Thanks for joining us. To be here and greetings so to good. your viewers across the world. Okay, thanks for having you on today's edition. 
of views on the continent we equally have uh, mr arthur mobley uh, you are a journalist and a, a historian thanks for being with us today absolutely i appreciate the opportunity and uh certainly want to say good morning from my side of the world but uh, good evening and afternoon uh wherever you are this is wonderful forum thank you mona Thank you very much. Thank you very much for honoring. I guess you are in the United States with about seven to eight hours of uh, difference with us. So it's really normal. You're in the morning. We are in the afternoon here already. So let me stay with you or let me rather go to South Africa, except uh, the director say the third guest is already there. Okay, let's receive uh, uh, on the platform Mr. Joseph Moses Olishange. Uh, you are... Um, a uh, human rights lawyer and an activist for democracy. A pleasure having you again. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here again today. Um, good evening. Uh, good morning for the others. Uh, you know, this world is very big. And I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thank you. Much. Thank you very much for honoring. I would like to start with uh, our, our guest from South Africa. If you can just please the decor of what's happening. Uh, we're talking here about uh, the president of your nation of origin, Mr. Good News Cadogan. President Cyril Ramaphosa is facing a lot of threats and uh, uh, threats of impeachment and allegations of misconduct. So uh, how, how, how do you welcome these allegations despite the fact that the president says not guilty of all this? It is very difficult uh, for me to have a concrete view of what is happening because uh, the current parliamentary process uh, through the independent panel found that the president has got a case to answer or may have a case to answer. That's how they've worded it. And uh, on his side, is uh, actually taking the case on review uh, uh, to the constitutional court. So until such time, all these things are cleared, it's going to be very difficult. But there is a kind of a storyline here that has developed over time. First of all, the former spy boss is the one who actually uh, spill the beans about this money that was in the president's house. And then secondly, the issue is complex because it is not just a legal issue. It's also a moral and ethical issue as well. And usually it is a bit difficult uh, to uh, actually unravel an issue when moral and ethical uh, values are involved. It becomes easier in law because the courts can find uh, on facts whether a person is guilty or not. But again, uh, if, even if the president were to be found not guilty in a court of law, in the political environment, the ethics and the morals are much more important than what the court says. So in the end, he is facing a parliamentary process, and that parliamentary process will go to a vote, and his own party has pledged support for him, and they have said that they will vote against the motion to remove the president. So even though the report from the independent uh, panel says that he may have a case to answer, it is not binding on parliament. Parliament does the vote because they are the only ones that, they, that can remove a president. On the other hand, at the level of the party, the party has always had problems uh, with this divide between moral ethics and the law. And they always want to take an easy route because it's difficult uh, for us as leaders anywhere in the world to actually be conclusive when it comes to morals and ethics. And I think it's a cop out to remain and uh, hide behind the law when it comes to leadership in politics, in business, in the nonprofit sector, everywhere right across. I, as a coach, I believe values, morals and ethics are much more important than what the court says. And then lastly, there are 11 million people that vote for the ANC. Mm -hmm. And I think at this stage, there is nothing that brings them together for them to be able to direct and influence the party to go one way or the other. So there is this dilemma whereby these 11 million people that vote for the ANC, one, they don't have shared values themselves. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there is no common purpose vehicle that holds them uh, together because there's only 1 million members of the ANC. The other 10 million are just scattered across the country and 
they have nothing that binds them apart from the constitution. So we are in that kind of a dilemma uh, in South Africa right now. And the president is in that dilemma because he has to prove innocence. And, 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 and I don't think he's got, at this stage, the tools to actually prove his innocence. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Mobley, what do you think about these uh, current happenings uh, uh, where President Ramaphosa is uh, being, which President Ramaphosa has been faced with? Mr. Mobley, at you. Yes, well, I, I would like to know where he buys his furniture because I would like to shop there. If I could actually uh, accidentally get millions of dollars in a couch, uh, that would be wonderful, you know. Um, but but uh, Sir Ramaphosa has a historic legacy of being a, first of all, a freedom fighter in the ANC. We have to put this... Uh, in a, in a larger context. For a long time, South Africa was under white minority rule. Um, and certainly before that, uh, more of uh, difficulties from, from European rulers. Uh, and there was a very serious effort to free South Africa from minority rule. Nobody charged the Vosters and the de Klerks and other South African leaders of, I mean, simple uh, misrepresentation and lawlessness while the whites ran South Africa. They ran South Africa with impunity. They were allowed to stay in the country. The National Party was allowed to participate. The White Party was allowed to participate in the elections and are still in South Africa to this day. They are also parties to this action against Cyril Ramaphosa. They would love to see him uh, leave power. They would love to see constant consternation uh, within the government, the continental structure or the congressional structure, a constitutional structure that uh, has emerged in South Africa today. So they're going to continue to be a disruptive force. So I, I, I think, again, we have to put uh, this conflict, uh, these disagreements uh, into some context and know that the U.S. and Britain and uh, other European powers are on standby to, to again emerge as forces and factors in South Africa. So Sir Ramaphosa, uh, for the time being, uh, has the right to due process, as you say. Uh, no one is, uh, can, be, can be adjudged uh, as guilty until they've had that uh, due process or been proven otherwise. Uh, and, uh, you know, he'll get his day in court. Um, but the ANC at this time, uh, as my brother uh, has mentioned, uh, is standing firmly behind um, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, and uh, they are going to uh, go, going to going to stand behind uh, their candidate and their leader and their president. And um, for now, it seems that uh, things are going to uh, uh, stabilize until this trial. So uh, that's. Uh, you know, where, where I see it at this point. Back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Arthur Mobley. Let's hear from you, Mr. Joseph Moses Olishange, joining us from Tanzania, I'm sure, if you are in your country. So, um, you as a human rights uh, lawyer, how do you see this present situation? Is there any hope for President uh, Ramaphosa to get away with these uh, uh, accusations? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on this particular question of whether he can get some way out of this process, you know, it's very possible whether he really committed, because now we are saying as any other person, he has the right to a fair trial. Uh, and these are just allegations. And, but we particularly remember what happened with Zuma. 
uh, there were almost eight or so impeachment process and the parliament never got through until decided by the party and now it seems uh that the party has so much of the influence again in this so i think it leaves so much to be desired whether uh, we can see another zuma process happening just few years after uh zuma resignations and you remember the, the other past president Mbeki never finished his term so is now coming like a trademark of south african politics but coming to this particular question you asked will he be able to get through it depends we have just seen the report from the panels uh, uh, incriminating the president and to me as a person uh, in africa in tanzania in some corners of africa it brings some really mixed feelings one of the the, the demeanors of the people we elect for office but again, the lesson that South Africa is at least teaching many of their countries in Africa. So it's not that Zuma, then Ramaphosa, and other South Africans are the most corrupt or so, other than the, the rest of the Africa. Is at least the country is having some functional systems to get accountability. And you have now, in a good system of governance, the people with more questions and with uh, some said here morality is so much important here than really law you can get out of the court process but we can really still question your integrity particularly in politics and that's not about law it's about morality how you misbehave and or behave in, in different aspects so to put it in brief when Africa, he can still say through, and whether he did it or not, but at least because he referred the matter to the Constitutional Court, uh, let's wait for the court to, uh, to to say anything. Then I think after that we can really see whether the Parliament will, because there was some sort of proposal for impeachments at the same time, a vote of no confidence at the same time. I think this story is building and so much will happen uh, in a short interval. It's uh, good news. We have the ANC, which is a historic popular party uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in South Africa, but it has been battered by soaring unemployment and continued violent crime, rolling nationwide power outages and allegations of endemic uh, corruption. Now, looking at the the um this question is directed to uh mr good news uh, director so looking at this uh, uh, uh whole uh, characterization of uh, this uh, anc party which has been ruling for about 28 years now what can you say about the state of south africa presently is there a need for a change of a ruling party there definitely is a change uh, uh, there is a need for change, I can say. And the reason I'm saying that is because, uh, like I said earlier on, uh, we have an electoral system here that doesn't allow the general public to vote directly for a president. And that electoral system makes it very difficult uh, for the majority people in the country to choose their own president. And uh, by default, then choose the kind of government that is going to be in power. So there is a need, not just to change the political party, but to change the electoral system so that in the end, the public can be able to choose the kind of person they would like to be at the helm. It, the ANC's own reports uh, state that uh, it is a corrupt party. Even the current president uh, said that the ANC is accused number one when it comes to corruption. So in the end, uh, currently, the party is not an image of what it stood for in the beginning of the democratic state. They stood for morality, they stood for ethics. Uh, even the apartheid system itself, uh, as my brother said earlier on, from a history point of view, uh, that government was presiding 
over a corrupt state. Because for them to be able to discriminate against the majority of the people of the country, they had to use corrupt means to actually do that. So in the end, there is a need to actually get the direct power to choose government to belong to the people and not to a party. Currently, the president is accountable to his uh, party, hence they are actually defending him. And the party itself is accountable to the few number of people that are in leadership positions. And then the people that are deployed in government uh, to be public representatives, they owe their allegiance to the party. They will be told how to vote, even if it may not necessarily be for the best interest of the country. That's where we are right now. We need a new electoral system. Thank you very much. Let me join uh, uh, Mr. Arthur. Uh, Mr. Good News says uh, the one of the solutions out of uh, the problem South Africa is facing is a new uh, electoral system. What do you think? Well, I don't think the electoral uh, system is the problem. Uh, I think the South African people have to make up their minds and I think to a large degree, they, 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 they have uh, voted. They, they're voting confidentially to have uh, governance that, that works. But you have to uh, decide that the, that is what you want in your country. You, in, in fact, all, all over Africa, we have to decide whether we're going to, to have governmental structures that work for the people or we're going to be satisfied with a system that works for business, international business. Right now, there are forces on South Africa as there are forces on every governmental body and every state in Africa to operate in such a way that you become functionally predictable and projectable for Western democracy so that they can engage and they can uh, have a uh, relationship with your country that they can feel comfortable in. It doesn't matter what the condition or the, uh, the, 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 what the state of the people is in these governments to, to those who operate outside their only concern is, can I do business in that country? Can I uh, obtain resources from that country? Can we do so on a dependable supply uh, and through uh, de predictable conduits? That's what they're after. So when they see a party in place, whether it's the ANC or it's the NP or it's the EFF, what they're looking for is a business partner and a business relationship with, with South Africa. And it, it, it doesn't matter. It's not a concern of theirs what the condition of the people of the country. So I'm just saying that, you know, we need to have a responsive review of what the people in South Africa want and need first, because that's what the revolution in South Africa was about. That was the change that the ANC the contract that they have with the people of South Africa. Cyril Ramaphosa, Zuma, Mbeki, none of them had any business in becoming uh, a corrupt element. There is no room for corruption in Africa. We have to throw off corruption just like we throw off apartheid. We have to uh, get beyond the systems that were imposed on us at Berlin and since then. So uh, we have to look to the people of South Africa. Can the ANC continue to be a force for the people of South Africa? I would think that they could. They have been for the last 28 years. Could they do a better job? Yes, but that is up to the people to correct what happens in the parties in their country. This is about people power and the people have to stand up and demand from their government, demand from their parties, demand from their nations what is needed and is vital to the people down to the poorest community in every corner of Africa.
tomorrow for your take on that now mr joseph uh we we continue to look at the impact we continue to look at the impact which the anc is having uh, uh, uh upon the people and also the impact which the people have uh, on their state through the ruling party we look at this just like the other panelists have said there needs to be a change of the electoral system so what do you equally have to say as uh, with regards to this is there is there need for a change of an electoral system or need for a change of the ruling party, Mr. Joseph? Okay. Uh, in my opinion, I think it is the business of South African people to decide who is to detect the charge of their affairs through electoral process. One question I can really again in my opinions electoral system in south africa is not favorable to ordinary citizens because they do not take a direct decision making in deciding who the president should be and the president has so much of the shock power once he become or she become the president so their electoral system is uh, you elect parliament then the parliament elect the president so you might not be in love with the person elected as the president though you're in favor of the party that elected the president and i think one of the fundamental changes that south africa needs they have a progressive constitution that's a fact uh they have some really sound institutions the public protectors and others and that's why we are seeing what we are seeing it now because of the functional system uh in other part of africa you cannot uh, question the president and then you you remain in the street is very very difficult but we they need at least this is my opinion to change the form of electoral system and adapt a system that the president is direct accountable to the people the people should elect and account the president it will give so much of the impulse in the in the democracy but now coming to the other part of the question do people and in relation with the anc again do the people really have the the stake in the in the anc some see ANC as a liberation party. And of course, they're all parties lawfully operating. And we have seen, at least in the last uh, 15 years or so, degenerations in the ANC politics. And it's no different from any other uh, parties of the 1960s, 70s, coming to going to Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and others. ANC has the, the politic of centralism, protectionism. They protect their people, even if they have been convicted by the Washington Court. We remember the Zuma process and what happens until now, inducted by the, the party and moved by the party, after realizing that it might impact their uh, campaign operation uh, coming in 2019. So, yes, they might still have uh, a support of the majority of the people, but we're seeing that slowing down as time goes. And this is so much happening because of the protectionism theory that they protect everything. As it, no, because Zuma, Ramaphosa are individuals. When they commit crimes, they commit under their personal capacity, not as part of the ANC system. But now protecting them, you are incriminating the entire party, which in my opinion, I see maybe coming 2024 or so, we might see a more challenging environment against ANC, maybe than it was in previous years. Uh, but with, with the electoral process, 
we have some system still, but the system of presidency is not supportive to the people. People are, are not included in it. It's the parliament that elects. And the parliament is mostly decided by the ANC. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Good News, I'm coming to Mr. Good News, Director. Mr. Good News, we have more of this pressure for resignation of the president uh, coming from uh, uh, most of our uh, uh, supporters of uh, uh, President Jacob Zuma, particularly would say uh, that most of the ANC politicians and activists calling for his uh, uh, President Ramaphosa's resignation are aligned with the radical economic transformation faction, which includes supporters of uh, the former president, Jacob Zuma. At some point in time, analysts get to realize that it's some kind of political beefing and maybe not necessarily uh, 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 having uh, President Ramaphosa really being guilty of the accusations. So can we say it's more of uh, uh, some backlash or some uh, beefing between the two uh, presidents, former and the incumbent? It is wider than just two presidents, being the former president and the current president uh, bickering about uh, whether he should stay or not. The root of the problem is that the politicians across all parties, the ANC, opposition parties, they are self-serving. So, so my brother here, um, Arthur uh, Mboli, uh, he said it uh, much more eloquent than I am saying it, uh, that uh, the people uh, will support uh, their leader. And and also my brother here, Joseph, uh, has also said the same thing. But, but what I'm trying to say here is that this is not peculiar to South Africa. Across the world, even in the developed, so-called developed democracies, you'll find that the Republican Party will do everything in its power to support an errant president simply because they want to save the face of the party. Uh, look at what happened with the January 6th uh, uh, in, in America and, and how that very same President Trump is now trying to run for the second term now uh, as a president. If the morals, the ethics, and the law were aligned and certainly so if the ethics and, and morality were, were sort of paramount to political leadership, you wouldn't have this problem uh, that my colleague has uh, actually mapped earlier on, that business, international business through the multinationals are looking for government partnerships with any governments on the continent, as long as their investments are guaranteed. And in that fray, you find that the political elites align themselves with the multinationals and the governments of those multinationals at the expense of the people. That's why then you need a system whereby uh, you will have to corrupt the whole country in order for the multinationals to be at the helm of the government of the day in any of the African countries. So by giving power to the people to vote for the government themselves directly, you are actually preventing uh, this apex at the top, where it's easier to corrupt a hundred party officials than to convince uh, 50 million people uh, to actually choose the government that is good for themselves. So that in the end, it should be good for both. There is no group of citizens that do not want foreign direct investment. There is no group of citizens that want a uh, war uh, every day at their doorstep. Everybody wants peace, everybody wants economic stability, and everybody wants change that is going to benefit at the citizen level. So the challenge that we have now is that the political elite have replaced uh, the white supremacists who were at the cream of the economy and who were creaming it and uh, gaining the benefits of a national wealth uh, for their own personal benefit and for a, small po a smaller population at the expense of a larger population. What is needed now is important to actually give 
the sleight of hand to the public to choose what government they want. But this doesn't come uh, without pain, because it doesn't mean that if the people suddenly have the power to choose their own government, then the ethical issues will go away. You then have another set of probably better quality problems. Most democracies in the world that work, they work because people in general are educated, not in the form of academic education. They understand the political systems. They understand geopolitics. They understand how everything fits together. In the end, they will then vote for the policies that will benefit them at a personal level and also for the larger population, rather than for few people at the top. So those are the kind of things that we need to take into account as we make choices for the future for our country. Uh, uh, still stay with me, Mr. Good News. I would like to get some clarification. You mentioned of the white minority, uh, uh, bringing to mind this question, which I know many of our audience would like to know. Uh, we, who, between uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa and former President Jacob Zuma, best handled the disproportionately wealthy white minority problem in South Africa? None of them have done it properly. Right from the 1994 until now, the question of the wealth gap between black and white has never been addressed in a manner that actually removes that gap. Whether it is in the form of salaries or in the form of access to the means of production, that has not been the main aim. The, the, the little that has been done has benefited only a few people who are close to the political elite. Those are the people who have been the beneficiaries. And those who had power, economic power before, they have not felt the change from 1994 until today. Instead of uh, uh, maybe experiencing ne negative change, they have actually multiplied their wealth uh, between 1994 and today. Thank you, thank you. Let me join Mr. Uh, uh, Arthur Mobley. Joining on Mr. Arthur Mobley now, let's, uh, we're talking about corruption at this point in time and, and uh, corruption is one of the vices which is uh, uh, really recurrent in South Africa, in most African governments in South Africa particularly. And when we get to know the reason for the eviction of President Jacob Zuma, we start finding uh, uh, President Ramaphosa equally being involved in these kind of uh, accusations. Just like you earlier mentioned, you really like to know how how the president does to save so much money in a couch. So uh, uh, what can you say about the corruption system, the way uh, corruption is being handled in South Africa, especially when it concerns uh, well, government well, officials? Well, certainly, uh, again, thank you. The problems that Sir Ramaphosa has are not uh, an isolated situation uh, for African leaders. Uh, when you model your design of how you're going to govern in your country after corrupt, inefficient, phony democracies in the West, you know, because there is no model. You can't use, you can't, can you say the United States is a model? We got a two-party system in the United States that has uh, a functional uh, a party that only works for Republicans and Democrats. If you, if if I wanted to form a party in the United States, there's no way I could do it, regardless of how much money I had. I could form the party, but then I would have to get on the ballot in all 50 states in order to be successful and be competitive with the Republicans and the Democrats. It's never going to happen. And under the present system, again, getting back to that point of being predictable. The companies, the multinationals, as Mr. Good News has mentioned, they want predictability. And they can get that predictability and, and protection of the status quo by controlling the parties that are in power. This is about external control. If you disrupt that system of predictability of what those companies want, then you 
automatically put your country, you put your population in a situation where they will work adversely to the needs of those corporations and that uh, that veneer of uh, involvement from these foreign companies will be withdrawn. Those companies will begin to pull out or project uncertainty about your about your country. They will also try to uh, sow seeds of instability in your country if they can uh, covertly do that. That's just, this is what they do. This is the pattern. This isn't new. It's not new to Southern Africa or, or, or Africa in general, uh, but it's happened throughout the Middle East. It's happened throughout uh, Southeast Asia and, of course, Latin America and all the way back uh, to, to the United States and the way it operates currently. The problem in South Africa today with what is going on with Mr. Ramaphosa, if I were in South Africa today and I were a South African uh, citizen, I would be for the removal of Cyril Ramaphosa. And I would do I would I would take that position solely because he is under an austere or a uh, he is under the specter rather of uh, corruption. You cannot afford to have corrupt leaders. You cannot afford to have uh, leaders that appear to be corrupt in Africa. And, and, the, and, and the reason is, you know, if we're transitioning from a system of white racial domination and racism and white supremacy into a system where you're going to have a similar system only it's conducted and run by people whose faces are black, then that is not a transformation. The transformation needs to be a mental transformation, one that the people can readily see, one, of the, one that the people can readily identify as true African leadership. I, I, I like the ideas of Pan-Africanism. I like the ideas of African thought. I like going back to what is traditionally African. And no, Africans do not need to be dependent on any multinational companies, any multinational institutions of, 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 of corrupt origin because Africa has all of the resources. Africa has the resources that they want. All Africa needs to do is to nationalize and to take those elements of wealth and power that Africa has under an umbrella of African control. If Africans can control their own, they don't need anybody else anywhere in the world, from China to the United States. They can do it themselves. It is absolutely a fact of having that kind of resource capability. And don't worry about the technology that it takes to, to run those things if we can do it, and we should do it, as a uh, institutional adjustment for the benefit of African people. We can run Africa on our own, and we don't need any outside influences or outside help. In fact, it's the other way around. Without us, Europe collapses in 90 days. Without Africa, the United States is absolutely crippled. And so is China for that matter. So Africans have the power, but they're going to continue to play these games, keep us divided, keep us in systems of democracy or quasi-democracy. Look what happened in, in England when the, when the uh, last prime minister, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, ran awry and was just accused of some very minor uh, discrepancies in, in, in the way he handled power, he was, he was removed very quickly, just like that, and replaced. Um, Africa, South Africa, should be able to replace Mr. Ramaphosa, and ANC should be able to put someone else in that position in the power until an election can be held. Uh, if you're going to turn over and you're going to follow that paradigm and that, uh, that structure. But... We've got to get to a point where it's people that control what happens. It's got to be from the ground up. It's got to be uh, from the will of the people that these governments and countries operate and exist. 
Mr. Otter, we continue with uh, analysis on this subject of discussion this afternoon as I join Mr. Ole Shange. Mr. Ole Shange, looking at the angle of uh, law and human rights, we've been looking, we've been following up closely the, 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 the trial case of uh, former President Jacob Zuma, and up till now, nothing concrete has been decided following his corruption case. What proves to us that leaders uh, can't go scot-free with their crimes committed in South Africa? There is uh, President Jacob Zuma, whose case has been going on and on and on. This is now since 2018. And here comes already the next president who is supposed to be preparing for a second mandate. And we have another corruption case at hand. How best do you think the judicial system of South Africa can handle such situations? Okay, thank you. And to, to start respond to that question, uh, I'll agree with my colleague uh, who said one, the corruption things we are talking here before coming to that question, whether the court can do anything. Uh, the president having the dollars in the porch and its systemic corruption is unprecedented. And I say is not only South Africa. Uh, it is because at least South Africa can investigate. Maybe so much is happening in other corners of Africa. And now to come to the question uh, on the legal issues, the human rights. Uh, one, because we said earlier, it is allegations. He has the legal rights to defend himself for a fair trial, this is just accusations, and the matter has been referred to the constitutional court. And the manner that some of us followed uh, the constitutional court process in the Zuma case, I'm at least confident that South African judicial system can handle uh, can handle the matter. I, I'm not saying cannot be influenced in some instances. We have seen someone has said what has happened in January 6 in, in the US. Uh, of course, not engaging the court process, but how some people in what we call world democracies can be twisted to suit some people's context. And it can be done anywhere, not only in parliaments, it can be done in courts. But at least uh, as far as the South African judicial system is concerned, uh, I'm confident they are capable of dealing with that uh, process. They have at least issued several orders with the Zuma, and I'm sure if this matter is to be referred for substantive hearing, and we can see some serious new exponential developments in, in Africa involving uh, sitting president uh, and but again, will that end because you have asked, for example, we had Zuma never finish his term because of the corruption scandals. Then many people hoped that it has ended. And now you have the sitting president and actually even Zuma like wondering how is the president capable of uh, hiding the money in the, in the sofa coach. And it is just shows how immoral the people we are trusting are. And uh, the person who talked before me said it rightly. Uh, African never hated the white people because of their color. It is because of illegalities of their actions, immoralities, apartheid and others. Then you replace that with the system of black people who are not only not accountable, but equally criminal like the other, uh, with the high mindset, uh, siphoning people's money, hiding them in foreign banks, now hiding them in the court. It, it just shows how our integrity is being really in the below part. Uh, but with regard to the human rights, yes, 
he has the right to defend himself. The South Africa has the right to pursue these things to ensure that there is accountability because it is their money, it's their resources, and it is their president, despite the fact that we said was not elected directly, but is the president. And at least the South African constitution says the president, as the head of state and the head of government, must respect the constitution of South Africa. It's not like other countries we know that the president can violate the constitution at will. At least we have some presidents of Africa that if the president violates the constitutions, at least there's some attempt to ensure that there are consequences. Uh, it's different from the others, at least, but they need to do so much better. Uh, in Africa, if we say democracy, we say South Africa, but we are seeing what's happening every time court processes, uh, no confidence in parliaments, because we have, with a good system of government, progress of constitution, but we have people with no morality, no integrity, who try to tear up institutions and fold the institutions. That's what I can say about that. We are gearing towards the end of uh, the program. Now, I'd like to know from Mr. Good News. We have President uh, 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 Cyril Ramaphosa himself, who had officially insisted that any party official setting or facing criminal charges of corruption should leave office pending investigations. Now, the president is, fa is faced with his own uh, uh, judgment and he's left vulnerable. Uh, to these people who say he has to step down because it's what he himself had already uh, declared any official that is uh, found uh, or accused of any criminal charges should leave office while investigations are ongoing president Cyril ramaphosa is faced with his own same uh, 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 statement what do you think the fate of the president does it now uh, it's not correct to say that he is facing the same fate because he is not criminally charged, and 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 neither is he facing any charges uh, from uh, the police or the prosecuting authority. So the parliamentary uh, process it doesn't form part of the criminal process until such time uh, the authorities investigate and charge him. Then that rule will apply. That's what I believe in, and it doesn't mean that I support. The fact that he mustn't leave, like uh, uh, my colleague here, uh, Arthur said, uh, that from a moral point of view, from an ethical point of view, he's supposed to leave office on that point, not on the rule that he put, but on the fact that now there is a cloud under which he is operating. And that cloud is not good for the office of the president. Mr. Uh, uh, Arthur Mopley. Can we hear your own concluding statement as to uh, what the fate of President Siri Ramaphosa should be at this level? Well, again, as I mentioned, I think that uh, there should be some adjustment uh, because of these charges and allegations, even if it means he temporarily steps down until uh, the uh, problems have uh, been cleared uh, or something to, 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 to that order. Mr. Mr. Uh, Arthur. Again, and again. Hello. Yes. Just yes. hold on a second. I can't get your feedback. Director, can I have feedback in the studio? Yeah, just go on, please. Okay. Uh, hopefully you have my audio now. Everything I okay? Am. I do. Good. Uh, um, well, as I was saying, uh, I think that uh, Mr. Ramaphosa, at least temporarily, should uh, step aside and allow these situations to clear. But the danger in saying something uh, like I've just said, and I, I say that because I do think that African leadership has to transcend the colonial, <clears throat> the apartheid, <clears throat> excuse me, leadership and operate above 
what those standards were. They were very low. You know, they meant that, that, that African people couldn't vote and only European people could vote in, in elections. Totally criminal, totally abhorrent. Uh, but if you're going to have a better system and you're going to conduct yourselves in an African way, then we need to be beyond reproach in terms of our leadership. And I know that people may say, well, that's a real stretch. No, it is not. It is, it is, it is something that, that African people have demanded through their actions, through their revolutionary actions across the continent. They have demanded that their leaders be transparent, that their leaders be uh, above uh, corruption, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The leadership just has not responded. Those people who have clamored and run to the uh, campaign stumps to try and get elected have done so with their pockets lined and not necessarily their couches, but their pockets lined with money from multinational corporations who have put them up to run in Africa, to become leadership in Africa so that they can continue to do business the way they already they always have. So the systems of democracy automatically set that element in motion. You adopt corrupt democracy, you get corruption as a result. Uh, that's how democracy works. Look at it around the world. In any country you want to uh, um, you know, use as an example, that is how democracy functions. It is not a system or a panacea, uh, or a system of panacea where everything works and everything is just wonderful and it's utopian. It is very, very messy wherever it's practiced, whether it's Britain or in the United States, it is not an example for how uh, any countries anywhere in the world should conduct themselves. But most of all, uh, in a place like Africa, because we have these emerging economies. So we have to have a better system, probably some hybrid system where we can uh, govern and we can govern from the people, from the bottom, for the good of the people, from, from the very bottom of the societies and structures in Africa. And we also have the power to remove those people who become corrupt or those people who are bad actors and they don't just stay in power for life. So, uh, but we can do this. This is, this is a very fixable uh, scenario but uh, we, we really have to open our minds and really think about it uh, from an African perspective. Let me end up with you, Mr. Olishange. Uh, uh, there are some spokesperson from within the circle of the president who say that these uh, uh, allegations and accusations are just going to make uh, create some form of distraction from the many crises that they have to deal with and to them the thing is a non-event do you agree you was lost almost so you haven't had the question president circle who repeat say, the question there are persons within the president's circle who say that these accusations are just ugly accusations to paint the president black and they think that they are they are just some form of distraction from the many other crises and challenges that the country has to face so do you think uh, to them that it's a non-event do you agree with them okay we have said it earlier and uh, my colleague has said uh, what the president is facing now is not a trial is something we are waiting for but i i don't think it's something just invented uh it can be done and many have done it so given now there was accusation then it was investigated and now there is a report in public uh, i i believe it was not invented for some other unknown issues and it is uh, the business of South Africa and it is instituted to ensure that it is investigated fully. Now, that was the committee for parliament. 
and the report come into public and they have said what they have said, indicating that might be enough evidence that the president has violated the law. And so because that's the information that we have, we believe in the information until otherwise reversed by the constitutional court as the president has referred it and it is the institution of trust maybe we can wait what the constitutional court will say on that particular issue much mr joseph moses onishange you are your man rights lawyer and activist for democracy joining us from tanzania it was a pleasure having you on today's edition of views on the continent we equally Thank had a we equally had Mr. Arthur Mobley, a journalist and a historian. It was a pleasure having you on the panel this afternoon, sir. Thank you again. Without forgetting our contact from South Africa, Mr. Good News Kadogan, a Pan African leadership coach, it was a pleasure having you on today's edition of Views on the Continent. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rita, and uh, gratitude to your listeners all over the world and <laughs> also to my fellow panelists. I'm Thank grateful. you very much. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, dear televiewers. It's with this closing note that we'll equally pull in the curtains on today's edition of Views on the Continent. Stay tuned as many more programs on forth on your Pan-African television. Bye-bye. I very appreciate all what you are talking about it. Good day and good day to all the viewers of our media. Thank you. Thank you.